So question is for you guys, what actually is a profit? One, what is a profit? And then the next question that obviously has to go along with it is what is prophecy? So one, one A, what is a profit? What is prophecy? So before we get to prophecy, let's deal with profit. And so I'd be interested to know what you guys believe a profit is. Now in the, excuse me, in the poll, 45% say that someone who speaks for God, 5% anyone who speaks, 7% one who gives the future from God, 42% says that one who gives accurate revelation, obviously ac accurate revelation from God. So what say you guys, those who may not have participated in the poll? Well, the answer might be a little bit different than what you think. Hold you there for just a second, and I want to actually go and deal with some scripture first. And this is going to bring up kind of an kind of an issue that has to be addressed. Because if we know what profit what a prophet is, well then we'll know what prophecy is. We know about false prophets. We hear it all the time. I mean, we hear them all the time, and we hear false prophecy. But what about a true prophet or true prophecy? So let's go and get from the scriptures, what it says, and let's see if we can glean something. So let's go to Deuteronomy, starting in 13, and then we'll 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 kind of make our way through. So Deuteronomy 13, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which you spoke, which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord. Your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul. Wait a minute. We have a problem. Yeah, we, we have a problem here. And we need to address that problem. We, we typically don't address this problem because we're thinking uh, when we bring this passage up, we're thinking about all these false prophets that are out there who give false prophecies. And we go to this passage and the other passage in Deuteronomy. But... There's something in this passage that we probably ought to address, and I think it's high time we address it. And so what better place to do it than here, and why not today? So let's go to it. Here's the problem. Notice in verse 1, what does he say? The word that's used here is the Hebrew word nabi. So this word that's used here, the word is highlighted on your screen. That's the word for prophet. Notice he calls this person a prophet. Interesting. Because when we drop down further, we see that if this false prophet or this person leads you away from another God, tells you to go after other gods, verse two, and, and tells you to let us serve them, verse three, you should not listen to the words of that. What does he call them? What does the word of God call that person that gives this false prophecy or that leads them away? Notice he still calls them prophet. It, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Well, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. A false prophet is not a prophet. Prophets don't give false prophecy. Would you all agree? Would you all agree that prophets don't give false prophecies? What If a prophet gives a false prophecy, is he a prophet? There's the question. So now let's ask that question. And I would just be interested to see what you guys think. If a prophet gives a false prophecy, is he or she indeed a prophet? And I threw out she because there's a we got prophets out here, all shapes, size, and colors, and genders. So if the prophet gives a false prophecy, is he or she, is that person still a prophet? Or are they no longer a prophet? And do we just give them the label of false prophet? Brianna says, nope. Uh, they would be put to death for sure. Spider Monkey says, Anola says no. Sierra says no. Uh, Ike says yes. Layla says no, not at all. David says no. Deacon says no. Uh, yes, he is proclaiming a word. By the way, I don't care what anyone says. I don't care what anyone says. Robert 2Z, the, the, the best, he's got the best prison name not being in prison. So I just love, love that name. I don't know what it is about Robert 2Z. <laughs> Don't ever get in trouble, but if you do, you're going to be safe on New York. That name, that name carries. That's a good name. I don't know why I like that, Robert Tuzzi. 
Uh, Tyrone says, no. DW says, yes, a false one. Okay. Meek Spirit says, a soothsayer. Okay. Devante says, no. <sighs> Guys, this is where it gets interesting. This is, this is where it gets interesting. Before we can figure this out, we need to just first deal with what the definition of a prophet is. And then we can determine it because I've said it myself. Listen, you're not a prophet. You have given a false prophecy. So stop calling yourself a prophet. And I'll try to explain what I mean in just a second. But let's deal with what the word means. The Hebrew word for prophet is Nabu and to prophesy is Nabu Ah. And th there's different uh, derivations depending upon the tense and so forth, what have you. And then in the Greek, it's uh, prophetite or prophetitis. Prophetitis depends upon, again, voice, tense, mood, and so forth, depending upon how you would say it. So what does that mean? What is the Hebrew definition? And the Greek definition is similar. It's a little bit nuanced, but it's basically the same definition. The Hebrew definition of, is of a prophet is someone who utters, who gives an utterance. Now think about that for a second the person who gives an utterance. So if that's a definition and just trust me on this. Now, you, I tell you what, you can go look up yourself. But the Hebrew word, the definition of it is just a one who gives an utterance, utterer, a, a herald, you know, a herald, someone making an announcement. That's that's the actual definition of a prophet. So now let's back up and ask the question again. If a prophet gives a false prophecy, is he considered, is that person still considered a prophet? The answer is yes and no, because it's going to depend upon where we're coming from. What, what do we mean? Now, let me just say this again. Let's, let's, let's go to some more passages and let's flesh this out because we've got to make a bigger point. We have to make a bigger point as we go forward. And you say, wait a second, Corey, I, we've always called these people false prophets. Okay, that's, that's, it's fine to call a false prophet a false prophet. That part is fine. Now, remember, there are other people in the Bible. There are other people in the Bible who are also called prophets. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 18. And let's start in verse 17. This is Elijah speak. He just got through speaking to Obadiah, not the prophet Obadiah, but another man named Obadiah, who is actually a servant of Ahab, but he's also a servant of the Lord. When Ahab, he tells Obadiah to go tell Ahab, I'm here, come see me, or I'm coming to see you. So verse 17, we pick up, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is this you, you troubler of Israel? He said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord. Look what he says, and you have followed the Baals. Now then send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel together. Look what he says with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So we've got 850 people who are called what? Called prophets. How could that be? Now, this is the man of God speaking. This. So how in the world could Elijah, who knows the Lord, knows what he's truly a prophet, why would he call them prophets? Well, you are a prophet or an utterer or a herald or an announcer or a speaker of whomever. Now, a true prophet in the sense of a godly prophet like them, we'll call that person a prophet. These other prophets, they just simply utter or speak for Baal. So technically, you can or truthfully, you can be a prophet even as a false prophet. That's not a good thing, though. See, if someone comes back and says, well, yeah, I'm a prophet, even though even though I got it wrong, I'm, I'm still a prophet. Well, no. Well, yeah, you're right. A prophet of who, though? Who are you? Who are you speaking for? On whose behalf are you speaking? Because if you're going to say that I'm still a prophet, even though I've gotten it wrong, well, then we've got a problem because the prophet is giving this revelation from God. Now, let's back up. There's two types of prophecies. So if we know what a prophet is, then we know what a prophecy is. A prophecy is similar. It's giving an utterance. Now, from our standpoint, as we're talking about true prophets of God, they're giving an utterance from God, a revelation from God. And so there are two types. You have the fore foretelling 
F O R E T E L L I N G. Basically, the prediction. Predicting a future event, telling what is going to happen. That's somewhere between 23, 24, 25, 27% of the prophecies in the Bible are this foretelling. Okay? The majority of prophecy, I think I got it right, the majority of prophecy in the Bible is not foretelling. The majority of prophecy is what we call forth, F-O-R-T-H, telling, admonitions, disclaim, disclaimers, exhorting. That's what the majority of them are. The majority of these revelations from God are not to say what's going to happen in the future, although a lot do, but the majority of prophecies and prophets are speaking about what's happening right now at this moment. When the prophet says, the Lord says to get get ready, now he may have also a foretelling part, or he may say that don't do this, don't do that. Then he may also give a warning as well, which is not foretelling, but then he may go ahead and say that because I'm going to do this in the future. So, th so sometimes you may have both of them combined, but the majority of prophecy and the majority of the prophet's work has been just simply proclaiming what is the fact, the indicative, what's happening right now. Are you with me? So that's why you can see in 1 Kings 18 and other places, you can see prophets of Baal, which is why when we go to Ezekiel 13, 18, we see this lying prophet, this one who is, I say, yeah, Ezekiel 13, this lying prophet who, um, where am I at? I think I, I typed the wrong one in. I think I typed, is that the right passage? I think I typed the, the uh, maybe I did not, but there's no need to even go to it, but there's this false prophet who um, the man of God goes to and he tells him something that other than what God has told him and he lies. And so the man of God listens to this false prophet and dies. So now let's be clear. Though there are other prophets, you're not off the hook because the person calls himself a prophet, uh, portrayed himself as a prophet. And when I say prophet, I'm, now I'm speaking of a prophet of God. You're not off the hook because you heed the word of a prophet simply because he said it in a wonderful fashion. His words were clear. His words were dazzling. He made us feel so good because of what he said. Oh, wow. His words, they were, they were so profound. They were deep. No, no. If you listen to the false prophet, still a prophet, he's still uttering, he's still giving uh, some sort of declaration, but who is he prophesying on behalf of? And what is he prophesying? What is he what is he uttering? I don't care how well, well it sounds, how wonderful it sounds, how good it makes you feel. Does not matter. You are still held accountable for the sin that comes as a result of it. That needs to be clear. There are people out here that will tell you that God said this, the Lord said that, the Lord said this, and then you listen to them and then what happens? You not You don't get off scot-free. God is going to still deal with you. That part needs to be understood. Look at the man of God who does what the Lord tells him to do. And one thing he disobeys. God says, do not eat here. Don't stay here. Keep going. Don't go in anyone's house. And this old lying prophet comes and tells the man something that, that goes contrary to what God said, which also helps us understand that we're responsible for what the word says. All of us are responsible for what the word of God says. And so that that part needs to be understood, too. You are not necessarily absolved because uh, there's not enough good preaching around and so forth. But you know what is around? There's going to come a point in time where it, if it hasn't happened already, I'm, I'm not sure there's no way to know. At least right now, I don't know that anyone's done a study. But there's going to come a point in time where you're going to have more bad preachers than you are going to have good preachers. I don't know if that's necessarily the case right now. We talk about a lot of bad preachers and bad churches, but there are a lot of good ones as well. Uh, they just may not be as big or as famous or as well known, but there are a lot of good churches out there. Let me say there are a lot of good churches out there, um, ran or not ran by, but that are led by a lot of good godly men. And in there, there are a lot of good godly men and women in there. So there are a lot of them. Just because there's a whole lot of bad ones doesn't mean that it's so bad. We're not going to be like, like matter of fact, the prophet saying, uh, it's just me. Everyone everyone out there is 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 they've gone astray. It's just me. And God's word was, this is my interpretation. This is my way of saying it. Shut up. Hush up. Hush up. I've reserved 700 or 7,000 have not bent, bent, bent the knee. Um, she says, uh, from Seer. 
what is the difference between prophecy and words of knowledge? Oh, that's a good question. It depends. It depends. If the word of knowledge comes from God, then it's prophecy. Uh, truth be told, it, it, truth be told, I guess there's a way that they can probably both be the same, huh? Um, because you're still uttering. But let's just let's just for the sake of this saying that if we're talking about a uh, word of knowledge from God, I would categorize this as prophecy, a revelation from God. If it's a if it's if you're giving words from God, it is a it is true revelation from God, which is obviously word of knowledge. Then I would categorize that. But now, can a person, a human being, give their own word of knowledge? They know something. Let's say we're talking about building a go kart, and he's very knowledgeable. Well, then he gave a word of knowledge about that, but. We'll differentiate the two, but a non-Christian can give a word of knowledge, okay? Uh, a non-Christian cannot give a prophecy from God, cannot give it, well, I take that back, if you want, God could, but he's not going to, uh, but they could, I guess, if they're going to, if, if they're going to do one thing, and I'll share with you in the end, or in just a little bit, about prophets, and then, because of the definition, does that mean that we have prophets today? Uh, no, pro no, um, um, Scooper, no, prophecy is not just related to the future. Ma most prophecy in the Bible is not future looking. Most prophecy in the Bible is right now, giving instructions, this, 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 this is what it is, do this, don't do that. It's a word, it's a revelation from true prophets. True prophecy that comes from God is just revealing God's word, revealing God's mind, revealing what God has said on the matter, and even sometimes if the foretelling the future, what God will do. That is important. As a matter of fact, we are told that in this church that we have, the Bible says that the church that we have is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, the question is, this: these, these apostles, we know who they are. We know who the apostles are, Paul, Peter, John. We know that Andrew, James, we know who the apostles are. But what about the prophets? And wait a minute, what do you mean built on the foundation, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets? Well, who's the, who, the, who are the, the prophets? I mean, yeah, who are the prophets we're talking about? Because you notice in the New Testament, we really don't hear a lot about these prophets. We don't hear their names. Well, he must be. He must be speaking about these Old Testament prophets. Isaiah. Um, <laughs> Isaiah. Um, uh, Hezekiah, Hezekiah. <laughs> I also look at these comments. Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, Obadiah. Is it? Is he speaking about those prophets? No, he is not speaking about those prophets because those prophets are not the foundation of the church. Now they do make way for the church to come about, but they are not the foundation of the church. These prophets are dead when the church shows up. As a matter of fact, one of the one of the things that 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 the uh, the Jews knew of and they kind of cried out about is that for the last four hundred years there ha there have been no prophets. There's been a silence from God. We're waiting to hear from God. There are no prophets, and then we're told that the next prophet that's going to come is going to be one that's going to make straight the way for Jesus. Now they reject person. They reject the person that's preparing the way, and they're rejecting even the way, the person who is the way. But there's this cry out that there's this, there's a famine of the word. There is nobody preaching the word. There's no there's no prophet. And the reason and I use that word preaching for a second, I mean for a reason, I'll come to it in a second. But so we got to go back to this question: though, what are the prophets? How are they also part of the foundation of the church? Well, if a prophet is someone who gives, who heralds, or makes an announcement, or gives a declaration or revelation, and let's just use this word that I like to use all the time: a revelation revelation from God, a revelation from God, which means it has to be a true revelation because if, if it's an actual revelation from God, then what is it? It's true if it came from God, okay? The question is, how is that the foundation of the church? Well, let's go back. Let's go to another passage. Let's go to Acts chapter two. Peter's going to tell us something that was spoken of that is going to begin happening on this day at Pentecost. He says, and it shall be, referring to Joel, it shall be in the last days that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. 
Well, let's just stop there. It says, I'll pour out my spirit on all. This is Passan, which is everybody or each of mankind. Now, the word that's used here is the word sarka. So, so uh, epi, epi pasan sarka is literally mean upon all or each flesh. So each type of person is going to have this spirit put out. Not everybody, not all people, not all flesh is going to have this poured out on them. Okay, that needs to be clear. But then look what he says. That when he does so, he says, and prophet to prophet to sin, which is they will prophesy. Who will prophesy? The sons and the daughters. Are we, are you saying that when the spirit is poured out on all these people, they're all going to prophesy? Well, prophesy how? Well, do you all think the prophecy that he's speaking of is going to be foretelling or forthtelling? Is it going to be future or is it going to be some, some sort of admonition or some sort of uh, right now revelation? It's going to be the forthtelling. We're not going to have a bunch of people with the spirit poured, up, poured out upon them or in them and then now all of a sudden giving the future. We're not, no, we're not going to have a bunch the Spirit poured out and then we're going to have a thousand Miss, Clo Miss Cleos and all these fake, no, we're not going to have that. We're going to have people that when the Spirit comes upon them, they will be able to give a revelation of God. How is that? Well, what's in them? The Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit want to do? John 15, we see that that's going to happen through the apostles that Jesus speaks of and then he reiterates that in, in John, I mean, Acts 1. They are going to testify or witness who? Jesus. So anybody that is a born-again believer, anyone that's a Christian that has the Holy Spirit in them, they are to, in some way, shape, or fashion, they are going to testify of Christ. How is that done? Well, it's different from person to person, but they will prophesy. They will speak. They will talk about Jesus magnified the goodness of the Lord. What happened on, at the day of Pentecost? Poured out on the apostles. And they do the same thing. And as we see the church growing, we see more and more people giving these revelations. Well, the question is why? Why in the world would there need to be these prophets, these revelations given? Why is that necessary for that to be the foundation of the church? As well as the Old Testament, we see these prophets. The word still means the same, whether it be in the Greek or the Hebrew, whether it be in the Old Testament or the New Testament. It's still the same, same function to give an utterance, to give a declaration, to give a revelation, be it the old or the new. These false prophets, the prophets of Asherah or the prophets of Baal or any other pagan prophet, they're just uttering. They're just talking. They're just saying some things. Now, you're going to find out that some of the things they're going to say, might, there's some truth to it. There is some truth to what they say sometimes, but oftentimes, oftentimes, if not all the time, I would sit there all the time, but in most cases, these prophecies from these false prophets, they're prophets, they're giving utterances, but they tend to be something that makes the person who they're saying it to feel good. It tends to be someone saying that God is going to do this for you or bless you, or it's going to be good times. It's going to be paradise over here, guys. It's going to be wonderful. We're all going to have a brand new car in our driveway, but I don't have a house yet. Well, you're going to get a new house too. You're going to get a, you're going to get an increase on your job. You don't like that wife? God's going to give you another. You don't like that husband? God's going to give you another. One. You don't like those kids? God's going to give you some more. <laughs> These are the things that you hear. When you hear false prophets today, we, we think that, well, they didn't have to deal with this back then. Yes, they did. Yes, they did have to deal with these false prophets. As a matter of fact, what does Peter say in, in 2 Peter 2 1? He says, But false prophets also arose among the people. That's past tense, arose among the people just as there will also be false prophets, false teachers among you. Now look what he says. I want you to notice the shift in words. I want you guys to notice the shift in the word and don't think that, that Peter makes a mistake. He says, false prophets also arose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will, dis, who will dis, who, I can't get it out, who will secretly... <laughs> I'm looking at the English and the Greek side by side, so I'm getting ready to use the Greek word, which is pseudo didaskaloi. <laughs> so I'm trying to say that word while I'm thinking of the English. But there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. So now there are going to be these false teachers, but he, wait a second, is it false teachers or false prophets? Which is it? False teachers or false prophets? Same thing. 
same thing. And I'm gonna show that how there's there's really these three words that are used. They kind of come together, especially in the New Testament, and under the under this dispensation of the church. You're gonna you're gonna see that in a little bit. But he says they've always been here. They're here now, and they will continue to be. And so you need to be aware. These false prophets in the day, what do they do? They said good things. Oh, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be amazing. What do they say today? It's it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be amazing. And so we would think that the false prophets today are a little bit different because guess what? Even though the, there was a penalty for stoning and killing them, they didn't always kill the false prophets. They did now. Killing the false prophets amongst the Jews, that was one thing. But the majority of false prophets were not Jewish. Although we do see some false prophets that show up. But now, before we go there, I want to go back to uh, I want to go back to Ephesians and I want to go to a passage because we're trying to figure out, well, why does God have to give us prophets to begin with? And why are they part of the foundation of the church? Well, he says so in Ephesians 4, 11, he says, and God gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors, teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So they are given all these, these four offices, four offices are given for the building up of the body. But I don't get it still. What's what's the point of a prophet? We have the apostles. Why the prophets? Well, there's two problems with relying on the apostles. Two huge problems. Can anyone guess as to what the two huge problems are? And, and they're two very important problems, two huge problems that we that the apostles could not solve. That it's, it's, it's not a problem that the apostles can fix. There's two gigantic problems, two big problems if we're trying to build this church. What do you all think that, that problem is? And when I say big problems, big problems. I mean necessary problems. Well, yeah, Scuba said they will pass away in time. Well, they, well, that is a problem. But more more than that, because at the we're talking about the problems that were there even while the apostles were there. Even while the apostles were alive, there's a huge problem. Too big of a problem, as a matter of fact. Exodus Genesis says so few of them, right? There's only there's only um well, 12 now because one gets killed. So we've got 12 that is including Paul. Now, the church also has apostles too. The church, when the church sends someone out, someone like a Barnabas. Barnabas is an apostle of the church. The Acts tells us that uh, the church sends out Paul and Barnabas. So, both, so Paul is an is apostle of the church as well as an apostle of Christ. Barnabas is just an apostle of, of the church. But we've only got these 12 that have been so endowed. So there's a limited number, isn't it? And they can't be everywhere. As a matter of fact, we see Paul setting up or, or having younger men, other men, teaching them how to set up church. Matter of fact, he's teaching Timothy how to teach people, teaching Titus how to teach pastors and elders and so forth. So that's one huge problem. There are limits, just not enough of them. They can't be everywhere like we need them to be. The church is growing. The second thing, other big problem, and this is just as big, maybe even bigger, just as big, maybe even bigger. Let's think about this. Paul writes scripture. Peter writes scripture. John writes scripture. James, well, even though he's not an apostle, um, but James, the brother of Christ, he writes scripture. We've got these people writing scriptures. We've got a, we've got a problem though. What's the problem that's that we find with these men that are writing scriptures? Nothing wrong with them writing scriptures. The problem is, just like we have with the apostles, it's not enough. There are not enough scriptures. Every church doesn't have scriptures. All of the locales don't have scriptures. Now, they're, they're, they have to write these things out by hand. You can't scan them. You can't screenshot them. Take a picture. Go to, go to Office Depot or what have you to get some copies made. They didn't have that. So they do not have the ability to recreate or, re or duplicate uh, copies of a text like we do today. They're doing their best they can, but they don't have copies like we have. Christopher, you, you, you're going somewhere, Christopher. Hold on. Doggone it, Christopher. 
I'm about to put you in time out because you're making a good point. I'll get there in a second. I will get there in a second. <laughs> yes, to your answer, to your question. But the problem is we don't have words. We don't have what thus saith the Lord. Do you all think, and y'all just tell me, raise your hand, say yes. Do you all think that at the founding of the church, in the midst of all these other pagan religions, in the midst of this law that the Jews want to bring about, in the midst of what whatever pagan deities the, the, uh, uh, the Gentiles, the Romans have, do you think they need to have the word of God? What would happen if they don't have the word? So do you all think that it's a good idea as the church is being founded? Do you all think it's a good idea to have the word of God? I think the answer is yes. Problem, what are we going to do about it? If there is no word being printed, oh, by the way, a lot of these words that were given by the apostles weren't actually written down. It's like, for example, Luke writes down what he's heard from the from these apostles. Mark writes down what he hears. He's not an apostle. Are you with me? And so what, what could we possibly have in place of that until we actually get the word? Oh, I know. How about these prophets? Well, where did these prophets come from? Well, Peter tells us in Acts 2, he's repeating what Joel says. When the Spirit is poured out, people, that's why it's, it's necessary for a believer to have the Holy Spirit. And then they do what? They get the Holy Spirit and they can give revelation. Now, here's the question. The revelation that these prophets have, is it the same level of revelation that, say, you and I have? Well, our revelation comes from us simply reading the Bible. So in answer to, to Chris's question, to Christopher's question, matter of fact, let me see if I can find it. Let me scroll back up, uh, even though I could just type his name in. There it is. So he says, so is it okay that all Christians should prophesy? Yes, but our prophecy has to be true. It has to be in line with the word. So in truth, Christopher or anyone else, when you give a word, you are giving, you are prophesying, but this is, and this is godly, especially if it's the truth, you are giving revelation from the Lord. Well, that's just, no, no, it, it should be something special. Says who? Why, why does the revelation have to be special? You mean to tell me if a true prophet repeats what another prophet said, that's not true revelation? Is, is that what we're saying? So if Peter repeats what, what uh, Joel says, that's not, that's not a true revelation? Yes, it is. Repeat, now we just have the benefit of having it written on paper. They had it to where it was given to them. Now, how much of a revelation were they given? Were these prophets, these people that were that, that were speaking of in Ephesians, were they given all of the word of God? We don't know. We don't know if they were able to give, if they were supernaturally endowed with the ability to give everything from Genesis up to their time. We don't, we don't know. We know for a fact that they were able to give what Christ had done for them on the cross because, again, that's the foundation of the church. We know so because it says that Jesus is the chief cornerstone and the church is built upon these apostles and prophets, not the Old Testament prophets. They can't speak about Jesus. They're not part of the church. And oh, by the way, they are dead. But these other prophets who are not named. But why is that important? They're not named. Well, because it indicates that, what, that their name is not important. But what they're saying is important, which tells us the truth of the word is of the utmost importance. Let me read something to you guys. Uh, I want to read this from, where's it at? Jer there it is. There it is. Read this passage from good old Jeremiah. By the way, I think this is important too. I, I, I've given this before and I'm going to, I'll keep putting it up because I think, I think this is just an invaluable tool. I wish I could take credit. I can't take credit. This is not my work. This is actually from Dr. Uh, Dr. Cohn, Dr. Christopher, Christopher Cohn, but I think this is an invaluable tool uh, where we see the prophets, we see who they're prophesying to, and when seeing who they're prophesying to and when they're prophesying, it helps us understand what they're prophesying about, what, they're, what they are giving. Now, a lot of their prophecies are foretelling, are speaking of the future, but a lot of them are talking about what is. And we see this battle between a true prophet of God that is Jeremiah, and these false prophecies. Here it is. Let's go to Jeremiah 23. He says, woe to the, huh, wait a second. Woe to the shepherds. Why do you guys think that he's speaking about the, the shepherds, these royim, these, the, these shepherds, because these shepherds are also equivalent to these prophets. It's an important point. 
come back to that later, but they've got these people who are going to do what? Scatter the sheep. There are these false prophets, really these wolves, who come in and who say something that is just not correct. Are you with me? Uh, by the way, thank you for the super chat, Jeff Ellinger and Chow Young Cat. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry, what'd you say? You said, uh, work for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Amen. <laughs> you didn't jump it. You, you're fine. You're fine. So let's finish reading. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Now, right there was an indicative prophecy. He's given a revelation from God, and it's right now. Now, is he going to give something future? He's about to. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. So there are these people that are tending them. How could that be? You mean tell me, God, you've left some folks to tend them? Yeah, because guess what? Think about it. Even in those days, you've got these prophets. I mean, these these uh, actual these actual prophets. They can't be everywhere. How many Jeremiah's were there at one time? How many Ezekiel's or how many Elijah's were there at one time? So there needed to be other people who also were given prophecy or given these utterances. Are you with me? So he says, therefore, thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who are tending my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not attended to them. Behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil you, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't attend to them. So now I'm going to attend to you. Lord, don't attend to me. <laughs> Lord, Lord, that, instead of that song, pass me not, oh gentle say, no, pass me. Don't, don't attend to me. But no, I'm, he said, I'm going to attend to you um, because of the evil that you've done. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture and they will be fruitful and multiply it. I will also raise up shepherds over them and they will tend to them and they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Wait a minute. Yeah, I, I, I made more syllables out of it than I should have. Look at what he just said. First of all, it's highlighted. Who are these shepherds? I will also raise up shepherds. Well, the he, the Greek word for these shepherds is poimenas, which is the same thing that we see in, in um, Ephesians. These are going to be a little bit different. These shepherds, these also prophets, they're going to be the ones that are going to tend to the flocks even locally. We'll see that in just a little bit. But notice also what he says. He says, raise them over them and they will tend to them. This is him giving a future prophecy. And they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified. And look at that last word. I mean, look, look at that last part. Nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. I mean, tell me, even before the people were sent away, even before this, but this is, they're getting ready to go into exile. Even before then, he says they're going to bring them back and not one will be missing. You mean to tell me he's really speaking about eternal security even then? Yes, he is. God didn't just start a plan at the, at the moment that we start reading about it. Anyway, so behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David, a righteous branch. Uh, he's speaking of Jesus. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. His day, his days, Judah will, will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which we will be called the Lord, our righteous. Really? Okay. Yep. Speaking of Jesus, speaking of Jesus, therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they will no longer say as the Lord lives, who brought us, who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the north land and from all the countries where I've driven them, then they will have their own land. So they'll stop saying about the Lord who brought us up, up out of Egypt. They'll start saying eventually the Lord who brought us back to our land. Hadn't happened yet. As for the prophets, look what he says. As for the prophets, these are bad prophets now. My heart is broken within me and my bones tremble. I have become like a drunken man, even like a man overcome with wine because of the Lord and because of his holy words. For the land is full of adulterers. Now, this is this is Jeremiah speaking. For the land is full of adulterers, for the land mourns because of the curse, because of the curse. 
What curse? Well, they're get there. This land is mourning. Remember, let's put it back on the screen. This land that he's speaking of, the land that's mourning. Remember, they have violated the land portion of this covenant where they're supposed to give this Sabbath and they violate it 70 times. And so they are on their way to be put out of the land. That's the point that Jeremiah is making. And there, these other prophets are prophesying something good, something better. Jeremiah was like, nope, nope, nope. You are going in, you are going into exile. Nothing's going to be done about that other than you just get comfortable, make a family. And now if you're, if you're alive, when it's time to come back, amen. If not, hey, you had a good run. You had a good run, you pagan. So uh, there he says, the past, I'm sorry, let me, let's back up. For the land is full of adulterers, for the land mourns because of the curse. This is what he's referring to. The pasture of the wilderness have dried up. Their course also is evil and their might is not right. <laughs> look, look at uh, Jeremiah. What do they call it? Bars? Is, it, is, that what, is that what we call it? Jeremiah with the bars? He says, and their might is not right. For both prophet and priest are polluted. Now, you're going to see a kind of combination between the prophet and the priest later on in the New Testament because the priest is just somebody that, that serves and attends to the needs of the people ceremonially. He says, for both prophet and priest are polluted. Even in my house, I have found their wickedness, declares the Lord. Now, this is God speaking now. Therefore, their way will be like slippery paths to them. They will be driven away into the gloom and fall down in it. For I will bring calamity upon them. The year of their punishment, declares the Lord. I want to drop down to go to verse 14. Also among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen a horrible thing. The committing of adultery and walking in falsehood, and they strengthen the hands of the evildoer so that no one has turned back from his wickedness. This is important, guys. All of them have become to me like Sodom and her inhabitants like Gomorrah. So these prophets, they're not causing anybody to turn back from their evil, from their wickedness. They're not. They're indulging it. They're staying in it. A true prophet is going to cause his people to come back to God, to turn from their sin. They're not doing that. Indication, you must not be given a true utterance from the word of God. Why? Paul says that this word, this gospel, it's powerful. So continue verse 15. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, behold, I'm going to feed them wormwood and make them drink poisonous water for the prophets of Jerusalem. Pollution has gone forth into all the land because of them. Verse 16, thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. Look what he's saying. Look what they're saying. They are leading you into futility. They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. That's the important part. This, what they're, what they're saying is not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord has said, you will have peace. You will have peace. As for everyone who walks in the stubbornness of his own heart, they say calamity will not come upon you. Nothing bad is going to happen to you, which is why you hear people say things like um, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Well, first of all, that's not for you. That's for Israel, too. That was for a time being. But they'll say these comforting things that let you know that nothing bad is going to happen to you. You're going to be all right. OK. All right. So God doesn't punish. Well, he does punish. And so stop telling people that only good things are going to. That's what they're doing here. And so why I put that chart up is because they're getting ready to go into the exile and you've got these prophets saying, no, we're not going to the exile, but you are going into the exile. And so that's the point here. And But even though he calls these prophets who are evil, who are wicked, who are not giving the word of the Lord, he is saying, he is saying that these prophets are prophets. They're just false prophets. They're giving utterances and they didn't come from my mouth. Uh, doesn't that still apply today? Uh, Mr. Nitty Green says, yeah, yeah, God hadn't changed. And so anyone that corrupts his word, anyone that distorts his word, anyone that turns his word for the sake of their own gain or making people feel good, anything that they say that goes against the word of the Lord, or as he says, his counsel of the Lord, they will be dealt with. Now, let's just say this, because I think it needs to be said also. What is a prophet and do we have prophets today? Well, Again, he says in Acts 2 that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. They will give a revelation. They will give utterances from God. Our way most commonly is going to be from the Bible. 
Just because you open the Bible and give an utterance from it, is the Bible still from God's mouth? Sure it is. And so I'm giving a revelation, so that part is fine. Now, does that make you part of the office of an apostle? No, you're not in the office, I'm sorry, of a prophet. You're not in the office of a prophet. No, that's a little bit different, okay? You will prophesy, but you won't be a prophet, okay? Very big distinction, very big distinction. But if someone calls you prophet because you're doing these things, so truth be told, if a person calls himself a prophet, he could go he could go by that title, but when they call themselves prophets today, they're not claiming it in a generic sense. They're not claiming it in a sense that, that we're saying right here. They're claiming it in the same sense of Isaiah and Jeremiah, someone that's literally hearing from the word, hearing, hearing the word from God. They're in some special prayer room where the Lord is always speaking to them. They're getting all of these revelations, these interpretations and so forth. Well, that person, remember, going back to Deuteronomy, if that person says something and it's false, that person does not speak for me. That is a false prophet. Are you with me? That is a false prophet. So when someone says something, God said this, the Lord said that didn't come to pass. Well, then guess, guess what you can do? You can discount that person. Well, should I ever listen to that person again? Well, why would you? Why would you? It's not like that, that the Lord didn't have any anyone else to give you the word. And by the way, you can go get it yourself. Now, if you're looking for words of wisdom or words of knowledge where you want answers to certain questions on how to do certain things today, that's different. Because then you're not saying that this is coming from the Lord. We get together and we have a council. What do we think about doing this? Or Mary wants to do that. What do you guys think? Or Frank thinks about this. What, what do you all think? Well, we're coming together. We're, we're giving counsel, but we're not saying the Lord said. And so I caution, I've cautioned um, pastors before. I've cautioned just other preachers, other people, period. Do your very best to not say the Lord says. Because if he didn't say, and then you say, well, then guess what he's going to say? You don't want to hear it. So at, if at all possible, and it is possible, do your best to not bring in God into the equation when he didn't insert himself. Uh, it's okay for you to say, I feel like this. I feel strongly about that. But oftentimes you'll see someone say that the Lord says, because they want you to take their word. They want you to believe them but they don't want to suffer the consequences, the penalty for being wrong. And then ultimately they'll say something like, well, you didn't have faith. Well, when God gives prophecy, how much, how much, when God gives foretelling prophecy, future prophecy, how much faith is required? How much, how much faith do we see required when God gives a prophecy? When he says, Israel, I'm taking you out of the land. They didn't have to have faith for that. He's taking them out of the land. When he's telling them he's going to bring them back, they didn't have to have faith for that. He's bringing them back. So the prophecies aren't determined by your faith. That should be evident. That should be clear. Just look at the Bible. Look at the examples. God has stated what he's going to do with or without you, irrespective of what you say or do or think or feel. You don't move, he'll move you or move you out the way. Move right over you. Okay? So why is all of this important? Here's why this is important. In the church today, you can call someone a true prophet, but not necessarily having the office of a prophet. But the person that's functioning most closely like a prophet would be who? It would be the pastor. The pastor would be the one that's functioning most closely like a prophet. And what did Jeremiah say? He's going to have these prophets, these shepherds, gather their people. And then what does he say? Notice, remember what he says, none of them will go missing. Now he's speaking about Israel, but it's going to be the same thing for us as well. None will go missing. All of them will be kept and brought up. Jesus tells Peter to tend to his sheep. Using that same word that's used there in Jeremiah for shepherds, he's told that of Peter to do with his sheep. Okay? Same word that's used in Ephesians by Paul, this point, man, that's the, the shepherds to do that. So the prophet today will shepherd the people and teach them. How do I know? Let's go back to it really quickly to Ephesians 4.11. The word in Hebrews 4.11 says, and he will leave some uh, prophets. Now, not these prophets, or it could be those prophets, but I don't think so. This word right here, 
pastor, teacher. This word pastor is the word promenas, which is what we see, see in, the, uh, in Jeremiah, and then teachers, which is the same word that he says in Jeremiah as well. So these, so these new types of prophets, not the office of the prophets, these folks that are given prophecy are different than these prophets up here. The ones that are given, the as he gave some apostles and some prophets, their prophecy, the, the prophets in the first portion of this passage, that it's different than the prophecy of the pastor teacher. The pastor teacher prophecy is not saying the Lord told me the Lord. No, this prophecy is just giving the word, shepherding the people, guiding the people and teaching them. Do I think there are prophets today? Well, I'm sorry. Let me, let me take that off of there and put it on the better screen. Do I think that there are prophets today? Anyone that gives a revelation of God's word is a prophet. Are there people in the office of a prophet? No. There are no more people in the office of a prophet. Matter of fact, even in that, looking at that last verse we were looking at, this is past tense that he gave. So all of these things that he gave, he gave apostles and he gave some prophets and he gave evangelists and he gave some pastors and teachers. Now, all of these he's through giving. He's no, he's no longer giving any more unless he reiterates this and brings this up again. We know for a fact that there is still talk and discussion about people. Matter of fact, it's anyone who desires to be in this role. So there, so a person, so a man can desire to be in the role of a pastor. So that part is still there. We still see the Pomenas. We still see those people today and called to be so. We don't see anyone else after this being called to be a prophet or how to be a prophet. Same thing for an apostle. Those two of this is done. They were still in effect at this time, but going forward, no. What about evangelists? Well, we are called, we're all called to be evangelists in some, some sort of way. As a matter of fact, Paul says, fulfill your, um, your role as an evangelist. Okay? So those two parts of verse 11 are still in play. The first two are not. But in terms of a prophet who's just actually giving the word, well, then fine. And as long as you do so faithfully, it really doesn't matter. It, if a person wants to be in the role of a path, I mean, the role of a, of a prophet, he really wants to so bad, well, then study the word. Study the word and give the word, give it just like it says, and then, then no harm, no foul. And as a matter of fact, the more you do so, the more you realize, I don't have to call myself a prophet. I don't have to call myself anything. I can just be George, um, the teacher, George, the shepherd, George, um, the Bible student, George, the guy down the street. That's what I can be. So what's the difference between pastor and teacher? There is no difference. Well, there's a difference, but that's not two different, two different roles. You've heard people say that there's a five-fold ministry and they get it from verse 11 because they count five nouns. They count five nouns and think it's talking about five different different things, five different individual things. The first one is apostle. That's one. The second one is uh, prophet. That's two. The third one is evangelist. That's three. And then the fourth one is pastor teacher. That's four. It's not pastor four, teacher, five. No, it's not that. Pastor and teacher go together, okay? De pomenas kai didaskalus. That is the, the it, it's literally written uh, that way in the Greek where the two are the same. So the pastor must be a teacher. There's no such thing as a pastor just giving these topical sermons only. He never opens the word, never goes into it. No, the pastor necessarily, the shepherd necessarily has to teach. And so if, if you have a church where a nice guy, good guy, but not teaching, uh, you you just got a friend in the pulpit. You don't have a, you got a buddy. You don't have a pastor or teacher because that, that's the important part that, that we need to have an actual teacher. Now, that, that part is waning more and more uh, as we move forward in the body. But that's what we have. So now, why is that important? Since we all are called to give utterances of the scripture, it could be our testimony, but whatever something that magnifies the Lord to give this prophecy, to prophesy, to proclaim, to give a revelation. With that in mind, with all of that in mind, and I hope this is making sense thus far. I hope it is. Let me know, guys, if this is making sense because it needs to make sense so we can look at this last portion that is vitally important. So while I drink my water, <laughs> tell me, Hopefully this is this is making sense and you guys are understanding thus far. 
because it's imperative as we go to this last portion, vitally important. So if that being the case, if that being the case, why is it important? Let's go to this passage. This passage is brought up a lot and we we're, we just miss it sometimes. In 1 Corinthians 14, now we're told not to desire certain spiritual gifts. We're not to desire spiritual gifts. However, read 14 verse 1. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts or pneumaticon. Now your English says, but especially that you may prophesy. The word that's used, and I've covered this before, malang dehenna prophetuete. It literally means there is no way around this, but rather in order to prophesy. That's that word again. That's that word again. That's why when we have this discussion, we get to 14 verse 1 and 14 verse 5, people aren't understanding what the passage is saying. I understand that there might be a little bit of complication that's brought about by the English, so that's why if, if there's any sort of discrepancy or misunderstanding, let's go as best we can to the actual language. And it says, Malan Dehenna Prophetuete. But rather, I want you to do so. I, I want you to desire these spiritual gifts in order that you prophesy. This henna is a what's called a, uh, a purpose clause. This is why I want you to do this. I want you to do this so that you will prophesy, so that you will give an utterance, a declaration, a revelation from God. Are you with me? That's why it's important. So these spiritual gifts, whichever the spiritual gifts are, whatever the, the pneumaticon is in you, however the spirit moves, it's in order so that you can give a revelation from God, a, a revelation by God, about God, for God, to bring people to God. Are you with me? That's why this is so important. The problem is in the church today, people run to this passage and they don't want to give a revelation about God they want to actually talk. They think it's talking to God. That's the problem. Now that becomes a huge shift. It becomes a huge shift in what God. So all this time, God has been trying to give a revelation of him to people. But when people go to this passage, they'll say, no, I want to give, I want to talk to you about me, God. That is not the, that, that, that changes the whole meaning from the beginning of, of, of time to now. Prophecy has always been given an utterance, a revelation about God. If it's not, what have we seen in the past where prophecy was not about God, was not about pointing people to God? Remember what Jeremiah just said about the false prophets. They don't point people to God. They, they move people away from God and they give people good things to say. They make them feel good. That was the false prophecy. That's what false prophets do. He would not turn around and give us a spiritual gift to do exactly what false prophets did in the past. But instead, all prophecy, true prophecy is from God, is of God, pointing people to God. Are you with me? That's why he says, desire these gifts in order that you give a revelation, in order that you give prophecy, not the gift of prophecy that you, the Lord came in and, and came in my heart and told me to tell you, that, no, whatever you're going to do, it's going to do, it's going to be to give a revelation of God, to glorify or to magnify God, what he has done in your heart. Are you with me? That's why this is important. So if a person is a believer, if a person is a Christian, they have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to move in them to cause them some sort of way, shape, form, or fashion to give a revelation about God that will grow the body that will edify the body, that will build the body. That's the, that's the problem that the false prophets had in the Old Testament. They weren't building up the body. They weren't growing the body. They weren't doing any of those things. This is why uh, what Peter talks about. This is what Jesus himself talks about. This is what Paul talks about. What these false prophets are not doing. They do for themselves, for the benefit of themselves. And they lead people away from God. That's the point, guys. So, yeah. Count uh, others more significant. That's what the prophet did. The prophet's job was, this is why he starts using this, this, this word of shepherding, of keeping them together, having them in this pasture, and directs them to them, which is why it's important to teach. The teachings are so important. Given the word, may not, you may not be able to give a lot of fluff. There are some pastors 
who don't have the ability to kind of say the word a certain way to make folks feel good, that's okay. That's okay. As long as you can teach the word, you give the word and then watch what God does. God then takes those words that literally came from him and the fact that you're honest and the fact that you are giving the word the right way. You're not trying to, Lord, I wish I wish I could preach like this person or preach like that person. That's fine. Maybe you can't. No problem. But the words literally come from God. You put them out there. Watch what God does. As the Bible says, it's God who uh, gives the increase. Somebody plants, somebody waters, but it's literally God who's giving the increase. And so you put the words out there. God is going to cause this to grow in somebody's heart. It's his word. And then watch how he deems you to be faithful, whether you're a pastor, whether you're somebody on the subway train, whether you're somebody walking with somebody. Doesn't matter. God is going to work in what you're doing. You being faithful and then watch how God blesses you. Now, how's he going to bless you? I don't know. I don't know. Is he going to give you a brand new job, give you a 40 percent increase, a 40 percent raise? Is he going to fire your boss who you don't like? and then make you the boss. I don't know. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that one thing he's going to do is give you some peace. That's one thing he is going to do. And then what you will have is somebody who has grown as a result of you being faithful to the word. The word is what comes out as a result of true prophecy. A true prophet will always give God's word. Amen. Amen. Amen.